Hey everyone, uh, my name is Will McNeil and uh, thanks very much for joining me on this uh, talk. I've spoken at IBC for Maxon before, but obviously never quite like this. So um, thanks for coming along. Um, as I said, my name is Will McNeil and I work uh, at a company called The Mill. I work in our London office and uh, my job title there is I'm a CG design director which really just means that I look after jobs that uh, tend to kind of cross the line between um, typical design projects and uh, jobs that require more sort of 3D. So that includes um, not just kind of linear content like TV ads and pop promos, but um, applications, interactive uh, installations, all kinds of good stuff. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those things today. Um, as I said before, I work at the mill. It's a big place, um, and I work in our design department. This is our London office where I work. Uh, obviously, things are a bit different now, and not all of us are in the building. I'm certainly not. Um, I've actually spent most of my time working from here. This is a camper van on the bottom of my driveway. Uh, so it's been a weird time, but it's also been a very busy time, and um, uh, actually, in a strange way, a chance to kind of focus on some work in a way that I haven't had a chance to in a long time. So I'm pretty excited to show you some of this stuff. Some of the projects I'm going to show you today actually got completed after the COVID lockdown began. So, um, you know, it, it isn't all just kind of big studio projects. It's stuff that's been done remotely and um, we've had to come up with lots of new, new ways of working. So um, you know, I'll talk a little bit about that today. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about kind of how I got to um, this stage of my career. So how I've been using Cinema 4D um, right from the start, uh, almost 15 years ago. and um, how I was doing kind of personal projects, loan projects, and then how eventually I built that up and got to be working at large studios like The Mill and working with large teams. Uh, so hopefully you'll find that interesting. The first thing I wanna do though is just share with you our design reel. So this is a um, mixture of projects from Mill Design over the last few years. Hope you like it. So you might have guessed looking at this uh, reel that um, we're a pretty varied bunch. We have quite a lot of different types of artists in the design department. Um, people like me who do a lot of uh, C4D, ZBrush, Houdini, that kind of stuff. Uh, but also illustrators, 2D artists, uh, After Effects compositors. Um, it's a pretty big group and um, I, I really like the way um, you can see in our work that there's a you know there's quite a lot of media types being mixed together. I think that's, um, that's really important uh, and fun as well. I'm going to talk about uh, a few projects in depth today, and this is the first one. This is a series of idents we made um, for a news channel called Al Jazeera English. Uh, we made five of them, and um, I'll show you kind of a montage of them now, and then I'll, I'll talk through the, the process of making them a little bit.
So as you might have guessed, making something like this requires um, a lot of different tools. Um, we use Cinema 4D as kind of our hub tool. Uh, Redshift uh, was really important and we used it across all the applications we used. A uh, bit of Houdini, a um, bit of ZBrush, uh, we brought in models from lots of different sources, and also um, this source here, which is called Quixel Megascans, which was um, really helpful. Um, it's a photogrammetry library that um, sources all kinds of different um, you know, real-world objects. They go out and they, they scan them with, um, or they take loads of pictures of them, they come back, they create very, very high-detailed assets with textures, and then you can use these um, through an application called The Bridge to bring them inside C4D. So, uh, in some cases, like one of our idents was a lot about just kind of kit bashing um, with these different assets. And um, that's this one here, which I'm going to show you now. So, um, you know, really this is a, a completely invented landscape um, that is made um, predominantly using um, objects and materials from the Quixel library. So we made a series of these, and each one of them was meant to kind of represent a different value of the channel. So the one we just showed you was uh, fearless, and it was about how uh, their investigative reporting went kind of down to the shadows and, and found the story even in the dark, scary places. Uh, this next one is about, um, well, we call it revolutionary, and it's just kind of about how ideas spread from one place to another, and how important it is that um, the news channel supports lots of different ideas, because even small ideas eventually become big ones as, as they pass from one person to another. So I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about how we made this particular ident. Um, one thing is really, um, I think, important to understand about these is we intentionally made these with really small teams. So uh, really no ident had more than two artists on it at a time. And in most cases that was one lead artist. Um, so someone with um, you know, not only um, uh, lots of on-the-box skills, lots of sort of 3D skills, but also someone with kind of artistic direction across the whole thing. Um, and we each had one of these. So this one is led by um, a chap called Tosh Fieldson, who did a really um, amazing job with this. And I mentioned earlier that um, some of this um, job was done during lockdown. Tosh actually completed this whole ident um, from his home. So uh, he was sort of halfway through when we went into lockdown. He started working from home um, through a remote connection to a computer at work. And, um, and he made this with a, another artist uh, who was based at the mill at the time, a guy called Ewan Davidson, who built a lot of assets for it. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, just about how uh, you get a lot for a, a small team, because a project like, like this could potentially use a lot of different people doing different jobs. But in this case, what we wanted to try to do was just be smart and um, design things in a way that, first of all, looked great, but also you know, weren't impossible to pull off. So um, one of those ways of being smart is just not overdoing it with the things that you put into the film. So in the case of, for instance, the, um, a lot of the kind of grass and, and the kind of simple flowing objects in these scenes, um, we just used cards, just simple planes, and we applied textures to them um, with alpha channels. Um, you can see this is the redshift um, material for one of them. And then uh, we used a um, displacer. So basically these are just cards that have a displacer with some noise and that's just making them kind of move around like they're rippling in water. And you can see here, um, if you look around carefully in some of the corners, just those objects that are just kind of gently flowing. Um, some of those are really, really simple objects. They're just basically cards with images on them. And the further away from the camera you get, obviously there's a lot more you can do with stuff like that. Um, then you kind of build up to the next level of asset um, so in this case, these, um, these sort of umbrella plants, I think Tosh called them, um, 
which we had throughout the film, and they were kind of an important narrative device to kind of ex explain how an idea exp kind of comes in from one side of the frame and leaves in another, like it's being passed on from one person to the next, like they're kind of whispering to each other. And so um, we pre vis and we use um, MoGraph tools inside C4D to do this. And then obviously you've got a lot of these things, um, but we really just created one hero animation for this, and this was created by Ewan in, um, inside Houdini. I think you could do this inside C4D as well, but Ewan chose to use Houdini for it. And then this one asset gets used, um, it gets instanced, so basically it appears again and again in the film. Um, but the memory used by it is only um, just that one object. And you can see um, you know, how great they look just by varying, varying the textures a little bit, using some procedural shaders to um, make things feel kind of unique and different. I think they're quite beautiful. Um, another type of model kind of building up in the complexity is um, something like this. Um, and if you look carefully, you might see in here um, a pattern called reaction diffusion. Um, this is uh, basically a procedural model um, made using reaction diffusion. I believe you can do this in X particles now. Um, we built this in, um, in Houdini as well, brought it in. Um, and it's actually you know, quite a complex thing, but not a massively difficult thing to make. And then uh, the more kind of so I guess you call hero models, so they're really the big foreground models. We used an interesting technique for these called volume modeling. And um, there are a few different ways to do this, depending on whether you have uh, things like X particles or you're working in the, um, the main, the core of C4D. Um, but volume modeling basically means um, taking uh, objects, whether they be splines or um, particles or any kind of geometry, and um, converting them to a volume, where basically they become like a big airtight solid around those objects and the the definition the amount of detail you put into that volume is kind of how faithful that is to the surface of the objects that you put in so it's great for creating things that are kind of you know one big solid thing but is kind of um, adhering to um, a form that you want to define beforehand and the main use of that was on our logo object which um, was a really complicated thing to art direct for the film because when you have something like this um, you want to make it look like the logo, you want it to be recognizable. And this is recognizable as Al Jazeera's uh, teardrop logo, they call it. Um, and it's Arabic calligraphy that uh, I believe does say Al Jazeera. And, um, you know, we wanted it to look like it was there and recognizable, but also like it really belonged in the scene. So we had to make it feel like a believable piece of coral. And the technique that uh, the team used on this was um, they built a base. Um, shape of this my logo using splines uh, and they just drew it with curves basically um, then they fired particles along those curves using x particles and then tra uh, froze those particles and you can see here in uh, the scene they would use something called the open vdb mesher inside x particles um, to convert those into a volume and that's when they suddenly take on this kind of solid shape so if you imagine something that initially was just splines then became lots of little particles eventually becomes these kind of bumpy, lumpy, tubular solids using the VDB mesher. We then converted those VDBs back into polygons. We took them into ZBrush and added a little bit of detail just to um, you know, add a bit of custom detail to them. And then we also brought in um, some additional splines uh, using X particles and the spline mesher and just created these kind of um, small ones that feel like they're kind of growing off, uh, off the main thing. And uh, this worked extremely well, as you can see here. Um, and then we, you know, we uh, put some more particles with some, um, cleaned some more little objects on there. And you add a nice um, uh, procedural shader with some uh, Fresnel shading on it, so it's getting different colors depending on viewing angle and that sort of stuff. And you really get this lovely object. And um, I think the guys did an amazing job with these because they do feel quite kind of organic and sumptuous, which is tricky to do in 3D. Um, another one, which follows a kind of similar pattern, um, was how we made the um, kind of swirly anemone shape. So um, we just started with a circle or a sphere like this one. We deformed it so that um, with a displacer so that it just takes on a, a kind of weird shape. Um, we emitted particles from that. You can see particles here. Uh, using a uh, tool inside X particles, we converted those particles into splines like that. And then we use uh, something inside X particles um, called the tendril modifier, which kind of makes them move in a, in a kind of, in a way like tendrils, like they're sort of sweeping around underwater. There's a tool in X particles called the spline mesher, and that's how we got these um, 
splines, uh, these sweeps along them like that. I think if you'd done this with the main sweep object in C4D, it might have added up to quite a lot of memory. This X particle spline mesher works quite well that way. It's quite efficient. And then you can see what it feels like when it's, um, when it's moving around uh, with some nice, lovely depth of field on there and, um, and a nice shader that's kind of picking up uh, the viewing angle and lovely specular on there. I think you know, that's probably one of my favorite objects in the, in the film. Um, I mentioned a few times the shading, um, so we used Redshift to, um, to shade this all, and we did that both uh, on all the sequences that were done inside C4D and also the ones that were rendered inside Houdini, and that's wonderful because the shader works, um, they work in almost identical ways, it's very easy to kind of rebuild them, take them back and forth. Um, we didn't do, in this film, as far as I know, any texture mapping. This is all done using um, noises and procedural shaders like Fresnel. Um, one feature that's extremely useful, especially when you have complex volume meshes like this, is to use the triplanar mapping because um, you otherwise, if you want to get a texture sort of evenly um, positioned on a moving surface, you need to UV it, and UVing volume meshes is extremely difficult. What triplanar mapping does is it projects the texture onto the object from all three planes, all three axes, and you can control the blending between the two. And it's remarkably effective, especially if you're using kind of noise textures like this. Um, and you just get a wonderful effect really quickly without really having to do a lot. Um, some other things you can add in here which are really helpful is you can pick up things like curvature, which is going to read the geometry coming in, um, and uh, add give you basically a color gradient based on that, so you can use that to drive more shading, and lots and lots of noises, which are extremely useful in something like this. Um, another example of a, a really nice shader, um, just picking up on the overall length of each of one of these um, spline meshes, these sweeps, um, you can see how you can just vary the color along them, kind of like you would with the hair shader, um, and just create this kind of lovely feel, and then play around with specular to get that kind of nice sort of um, nice effect. I believe there's also quite a bit of subsurface scattering going on here, which gives it that kind of really organic feel, like it's kind of slightly translucent. Um, lovely effect. I'm going to be a bit cheeky here and um, jump into a project that, um, well, part of the same project, but that was done in Houdini, just to explain a little bit about kind of how um, procedural shading can be used in another situation. Um, and this is, uh, whilst done in Houdini, is, is equally true for C4D. Um, I was in charge of the um, uh, sort of sandy desert film called uh, Diversity, and um, we built mountains for this from scratch. None of this stuff is based on the real world, it's all kind of imaginary, and um, we needed to build uh, procedural shaders for this. So we did use some texture maps that came from um, the Quixel library. Um, you can see them here. Those three texture maps are being used in this film, or in this scene, and um, the trick is uh, a couple things. First of all, how do you mix and match them? How do you apply them to the right objects? And also, how do you then kind of modify them to add details like, for instance, the um, the stepped, kind of stratified, eroded look. You can see these sort of bands of color along the height of the rocks. So um, just as in C4D and Houdini, um, we have access inside Redshift to attributes, basically information about the surface that we're using. So I mentioned curvature earlier, that's one of them. Um, but uh, within the Houdini um, geometry that I've got here, I also have things like height, um, information about uh, which, is, which bits of the surface are meant to be kind of flat and sand and which bits are meant to be rock. Uh, things like curvature, sorry I mentioned curvature, um, slope, um, which is available inside uh, C4D in the terrain shader. These are all extremely useful for basically creating um, quite luscious, vivid textures um, without having to kind of go in and paint anything. Nothing in here was kind of hand-painted. One thing that um, you can see quite clearly is how basically you can use the height information. So I've got the height coming in from my model, and I'm just able to use that in a gradient that goes from bottom to top, and you can see the, the long ramp gradient there on the right. Um, with all those different sort of notches in it. That's what makes the um, sort of stepped, stratified, eroded rock look inside the, um, uh, on the peaks of the mountains. So, um, I mean, that was really cool. Uh, procedural shading is something I've been into for a long time. Uh, years ago, I did a tutorial about shading a mountain, um, all using procedural shaders inside C4D. Um, they're incredibly powerful, and now that you have this inside a node-based system, um, it's actually really awesome. I, I think you be amazed at what you can achieve using these things. 
um, that's it for the Al Jazeera project. The, um, there's a lot more about this project on our website. Um, as I mentioned, there are five idents. Four of them were done entirely in CG, in C40 and Houdini. One of them involved live action, uh, above the water surface footage that we shot, uh, that we acquired, uh, and then did a lot of post-production on. Um, go check them out. We're really pleased with the way. Um, that's me, by the way, at the mill. Uh, and that's me being called an artist, which is something I always found, um, I still kind of find kind of amusing. Uh, when I started putting this power project together, putting this talk together, if you will, I thought about, uh, especially with the Al Jazeera project, how much I was mentioning other pieces of software and um, a team and working with others. And um, I, got, I became kind of aware of the fact that this might sound a little bit like, well, if you don't have a team like this, you can't, or a software like that, you can't do these projects. Um, and I wanted to point out that you know, C4D has basically been my loan tool for most of my career. And actually, most of my career, I've been a loan artist working kind of on my own projects. Um, I actually started out doing 3D animation about 15 years ago when I realized that I really wanted to be a, a creative artist, but I, I didn't really have um, the, the tools personally to be a, a kind of fine artist. I didn't really find that I was ever able to do anything like drawing or painting. Um, uh, and, and digital art was always going to be the, the way for me. Uh, I started out a long, long time ago um, when schools had one computer for 500 children um, using an application called, um, I believe it's called Logo, and, and doing little vector art where you give instructions to a little turtle that moves around a screen. And I, I think I've actually been hooked on digital art ever since then. Uh, I remember when I was, um, uh, I think in my teens, and the uh, Macintosh computer came out and they started... Uh, started talking about undo, and I thought undo is about the coolest thing ever in the world. Um, obviously, if you're a Mac aficionado, you'll be cross because it says Control Z and not uh, Apple Z. But anyway, um, I've been uh, you know I've been using computers to make art for a long time, and most of that time I've been doing it myself. Um, I actually started out doing uh, 3D art um, in the shed. <laughs> Uh, moved from a shed to a camper van, um, but I was just learning on my own, and I was doing what interested me. And I think um, this is what's so important, and what I'm trying to kind of get across here is, if you're if you're starting out with this stuff, or, or you're not part of a studio, or you're you're doing your own thing, and you want to kind of get um, get noticed and and you know do things well, it really makes sense to start with the things that you love. So when I first started getting into 3D animation, one thing I really wanted to make were terrains like this. Part of the reason I used to live in Colorado where I was surrounded by mountains. And so I started making terrains and then um, after a, a few years of messing around, I, I started to make kind of more advanced animations. I think I made this about um, about 10 years ago, I think, uh, in C4D using V-Ray. Um, and these were just experiments, just things I was doing for fun. But then these things that I was doing for fun became bigger jobs. So. Um, eventually I started doing um, documentary work for the BBC and Channel 4. So, um, you know, that information, that knowledge that I picked up during the terrains became really useful when I started, I would start to do things like big CG worlds and maps for ancient history programs. And um, so, uh, something I did for Channel 4 about Stonehenge. So the thing that started as an experiment eventually became, um, the, became the paid job, you know, the, the quite good job in fact. And, um, and I did a lot of this stuff just on my own. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot, you know, obviously the, the stuff doing terrains and all that stuff, that eventually led to a job like the Al Jazeera one, which I just showed you, where, you know, I felt like I had a lot of the knowledge I needed going into it, because not only did I love doing this stuff, but I've been doing it for a really long time. Um, same goes for another test I did uh, many years ago, just kind of trying to get my head around um, shading in Arnold and, and building a net, knit setup. Um, so I built this knit setup, just did it for fun. Um, it actually turned out to be a lot easier than I expected. And um, you know, then you know, years went by and uh, a couple months ago, um, I was asked to do a job involving a lot of knit work for um, uh, Manchester United. So again, that kind of knowledge that I picked up, looking kind of knitting, embroidery, um, that enabled me to do these style frames that then became the basis for this project for um, Manchester United. Um, and then along with the team, we were able to create some pretty amazing stuff. Um, a big shout out to an artist called Dan Yargichi who created some of this amazing embroidery setup that we used here. But again, you know, something that started as an experiment became a project, a real project. Uh, last one of these, I promise. Um, years ago, I made this... Um, I Every day. 
uh, made this film um, about elephants. It was a charity project we made for an ad agency. Um, made this inside C4D extremely quickly, and it got me really interested in how I could do kind of non-photoreal rendering inside C4D, and actually push things in kind of the opposite direction, go for something that's a lot more kind of inventive and, um, and expressive than necessarily um, big photoreal CG or, or you know, approaching photoreal CG. Um, and then that got me into thinking about like how I could build other things in, inside um, inside C4D and using CG. So then I built this. Uh, um, let's just run this again. Uh, this paint setup. Um, I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, how can I um, how can I turn that into something? And then eventually that became the basis of this big paint tool, which I now make that works in Houdini, um, called Stroke It, where you can turn photographs into paintings really quickly. And the point I'm trying to get at here is that it's experimentation that led to all these things. So if you start out doing the stuff that interests you and that you love, then it just kind of comes easily. And you know, if you, if you want to make work that people like, chances are the best stuff you can make is the stuff that you like. Talking about experimenting, um, we have a culture of kind of encouraging experimenting in the mill with art um, and different ideas. And um, I'm going to show you now our R&D reel, which is something that we keep um, uh, kind of updating inside the studio and just ask everyone when they're working on something, whether it's for a job or not, to kind of contribute their favorite bits. And then we put it into um, a reel like this one. So I'm going to talk about one more job now. Um, this is uh, an oldie but a goodie, and uh, it's got a lot of interesting kind of techniques and approaches inside it. Uh, it's for a company called Lush, who make very sweet-smelling cosmetics and soaps. Um, Lush really aren't that into kind of normal advertising. They're more about like um, you know creating kind of campaigns about ideas rather than necessarily just putting big ads out about what they um, what they sell. So for instance, they did a, an internet freedom campaign, which is about getting uh, internet access to more people around the world. They put on events. Uh, this one's Brian May from Queen talking about, um, I think he's talking about preserving, uh, protecting badgers. Um, yeah, I mean, not the kind of stuff you'd expect from a, a cosmetics company necessarily. And um, they asked us to come up with uh, a series of animations that could help them explain what it was like to have one of their massage treatments or spa treatments. Um, so they invented this spa treatment um, called synesthesia, and it was all about kind of mixing your senses. So um, synesthesia is like when um, you hear a sound and it makes you see a color or you smell something and it makes you think of a, a, a sound or patterns. And basically your, your signals and your senses becoming kind of cross-wired. And this uh, treatment they came up with, uh, synesthesia, was kind of all those things. Um, as there was a, a score that was written specifically for it, some music that went with it, the massage was carefully choreographed, there was um, uh, aromatherapy was going on. There's all kinds of cool stuff. Um, I actually got to have one of these, and yeah, it was really, it was pretty good actually. Um, they asked us to come up with a way to kind of turn that um, experience into an animation, so they could they could explain it to people without having to go through that long explanation that I just went through. And so they said, you know, can you show what this would feel like? So our creative director Carl Addy came up with this quite cool idea of literally showing what it would feel like. And by literally, I mean like recording information off of people's bodies as they were having a massage, and then turning that information, that data stream, into some kind of cool animation. So we actually uh, spent several weeks with um, a technologist, that's, his, that's him up in the uh, top right, his name's Noel, uh, attending these sessions of people having massages and um, huddled in a corner with a laptop while people were being massaged. Um, he, he smelled like 
a spa treatment for about a month afterwards and and we recorded all this information and we turned it into um, a series of um, short animation sequences which I'm going to show you now. So one of the interesting challenges on this project was to kind of turn this into a scientific visualization, visualization that didn't feel too scientific because um, whilst we wanted to make sure that it felt factual and accurate, we also didn't want it to feel like you were looking at a bunch of um, computer screens reading out information. We wanted to create something that kind of felt on brand for Lush and felt quite beautiful. So we had all this data that we recorded and then we needed to figure out kind of how to turn it into something a little bit more beautiful like you saw in the film there. Um, so often things like this start with um, some lot of research. Uh, this is our Pinterest board um, which is extensive and um, lots and lots of people contributed to it. Um, it's a really great board but it's also kind of intimidating as an artist when you look at it because you're just thinking there's so many different things in here I could make. Um, so if you do go make Pinterest boards or arena boards or whatever you're using now for this kind of stuff, one thing I would say um, from a kind of 3D artist perspective is be sure to kind of narrow it down to like specific references about um, lighting, texturing, uh, mood, so that, um, well, you don't do what I do when I looked at this and just think, oh, I'll make this, and then 10 minutes later think, oh, I'll make that, because it was all a, quite a lot of nice stuff to take in. So we made four different um, animations for this. The top left is heartbeat, the top right is touch, the bottom left is um, breath, and the bottom right is brainwaves. And I'm going to talk about now how we how we try to turn that information into animation. So uh, data streams come into us in a lot of different ways, but primarily they are just um, numbers over time. So it's basically a spreadsheet. And in this case, this was um, heartbeat. So we monitored the heartbeat. Um, you can imagine that just basically as like a kind of plot over time, of, um, you know, values going up and down, and um, my colleague Tosh built this setup uh, inside C4D using a bit of X particles, and he just created um, a setup where the um, surface of this object is uh, moved by um, an effector which is driven by the data stream. So um, it's basically just going up and down and it's having some dynamic response because of the X particles, and then he's built this really beautiful shader that goes along with that. Um, and it's just, you know, it really does kind of evoke heartbeat and it looks quite beautiful at the same time. Uh, the breath one um, is a similar idea. The breath comes in as a, a series of numbers, um, sort of values over time. And uh, again, Tosh built this using, um, I believe he used the uh, hair set up inside C4D and um, with lots of dynamic control. And basically at the either end of these strands you have uh, objects which are kind of controlling them and vibrating and moving up and down, and those vibrations are controlled by the data that comes in. I worked on the other two, the touch and the heartbeat, um, sorry, the touch and the brainwaves 
um, animation. Uh, touch was interesting because we had this idea at first that we were going to um, use this sensor called galvanic skin response. And that's the kind of sensor that's used largely in lie detectors. You put it on two different sensors on someone's chest, and when they start to sweat, which people do when they lie, um, or when they're nervous, uh, then an electric signal is able to travel between the two um, sensors, the two um, conductors. We found that as soon as you did this on someone having a massage, the data went off the scale right away because they start to get, their body starts to get warm and they start to sweat and, um, you know, before you know it, the, the numbers are kind of meaningless. We found out instead that if you attached one of the uh, conductors to the person having the massage and the other person to the person giving the massage, you got some really cool um, results. That's what this is. Um, this is our plot inside C4D. So, um, this is something I, I think is really important whenever you're doing animation, uh, especially kind of data-driven stuff, is let's just see right away what it looks like. So this comes into C4D as a spreadsheet. You are, in fact, able to import uh, three-column spreadsheets, um, tab-delimited spreadsheets, into C4D. Um, and basically what this is looking at here is just um, time is the x-axis, so from left to right, and then the intensity of that touch is what's going to make it go up and down, or the y-axis. And um, you can see, if you look at it really carefully, that there is a very, very clear kind of um, choreography and um, rhythm um, to, or meter to this, uh, to this whole massage. That's about an hour and 10 minutes of treatment there um, from start to finish. And you can see there are kind of moments where you get, um, you know, kind of gentle uh, touches and then you get really strong ones and then you get these kind of big intense ones. Um, and it is kind of interesting to see that, uh, you know, they really have thought about the, the timing of all this stuff when they thought out this massage. Um, we then wanted to take that from being just a, a kind of up and down wave into something a lot more attractive and interesting to look at. So we made this thing. Uh, my daughter calls it the toothpaste crown. And this is pretty much, in fact, just that data wrapped in around in a, in a, in a torus shape. And... Um, and then with some other interesting kind of elements added to it. So I'll show you what those are now. Um, basically, we wanted to get this kind of art-directed sense of massage into this, like you really are kind of being touched and your skin is being kind of squeezed and twisted and, and kneaded. And um, we we're trying to figure out how to kind of make the data drive that. So well, I showed you the data plot that came in before. What we ended up doing was um, building a system where we could have that also interpolate between a few different kind of base shapes. So, um, by the way, the whole sequence was made in um, C4D. We just built some base, base shapes inside Houdini. Um, so I built base shapes like this one, which kind of represent different types of um, strokes that the massage therapist is going to apply. And so you have kind of the little jagged ones and big deep ones, and then these kind of rough, twisty, uneven ones. And then when you apply the data, you can kind of mix all these together. So basically, depending on the intensity of the, of the values, we could apply one different type of stroke over another one. And so you can see here, you get like in the background, that kind of really sort of rough mixed up one. And in the foreground, you get more of these sort of smooth ones. And we just basically morphed between those depending on the type of information or the, the intensity of the data that was coming through at that time in the massage. Uh, you can see there the four different ones again. And basically, you kind of morph between them um, using time as your kind of animation, your kind of terminator of animation, and um, that's what you get. The next one is uh, the brain waves, which um, I did as well. And I mentioned earlier about this uh, Pinterest board, about how many different crazy ideas there were that we could try, and you can see how many different things I tried before we zeroed in on one of them. Um, for a long time, these are my style frames, by the way, um, for a long time we were going to go with this, which is kind of this sort of underwater fish scaly um, kind of thing. And um, we liked it and we had it animating really well, but we agreed at the end that it wasn't really feeling like brain waves. It was feeling like something quite different. Um, so one of my colleagues at the mill, James Lee, uh, did some tests and built this setup quite quickly, just basically taking a brain model and uh, you know a 3D brain model and firing particles inside X particles around inside it and generating trails from where they went. And um, as we looked at it, we thought, yeah, this actually feels quite a lot like um, neurons in the brain. 
And, um, you know, that was something we really thought was effective for this. We just also were aware that it might feel a little bit too scientific if we sort of literally said these are, these are neurons, because obviously we didn't do brain scans here. We just did um, recorded brainwave data. Uh, so the idea now is basically how do we take this idea, apply the data to it, and maybe make it a little, a little kind of more kind of like lush and a little less scientific. So um, this is where we had to kind of become a little bit of a scientist here. Our uh, chief technologist, Noel Drew, um, kind of explained to us what the different values meant, um, what we were getting um, from the brain waves. Unlike the other... Um, data that was coming in, the, the brain scan information, or sorry, the brain wave information is actually five different channels. And each one of them kind of represents a different state of thinking uh, or a different state of consciousness. Um, but it's not like they kind of one switches on and then the other switch off. It's kind of a constant, um, they're const all constantly there. And it's about just noticing when one is a little bit more obvious than the other. So we had to build a system where we could try to sort of understand what this data was doing with the brainwave information was saying to us, and then how to turn that into something that looked pretty. So the first thing we did was we created um, brainwave uh, kind of personalities. So this animation here is not based on any data. It's just based on kind of our own sort of interpretation of the different brainwaves. And there are three of them represented here. And I can't remember which brainwave which means which, but basically you have ones that are very kind of that move very, very slowly, and those sort of represent the more kind of chilled out state. And you have others that are kind of moving really fast and frantically, and they, they represent something you know, closer to kind of uh, full alertness or possibly even panic. And so we did these animations um, without the data. We, we created these manually. And then we realized what we could do is make the data kind of determine which one of these animations was going to be brightest at any given time. So um, by that way, basically the, the data is kind of showing us which one of these is going to be more obvious. And by doing that, it kind of creates a, a personality for the shot that is based on the brainwave data. I mentioned earlier that you can, in fact, bring in um, spreadsheets inside uh, C4D. They, it only, as far as I know, currently accepts three column spreadsheets. But basically, if you put in three blank columns into uh, an Excel or any kind of spreadsheet um, and put numbers into the first three columns, you'll get something like this when you import it into um, into a geometry in the structure browser, structure manager. And um, so this allows us to basically bring in that data into C4D. Um, it comes in as geometry, but you can kind of quite easily reimagine that as, um, as information spread out over time. Um, what we needed to do was then come in with a way of um, turning those numbers, normalizing that data, because those numbers go kind of all, all around um, you know, all around the chart. So basically one brain wave might, might range from negative a thousand to positive a thousand, and another might go from negative a million to positive a million. And what we want to do is make these all kind of play on a level, level playing field. So we built a setup inside um, Expresso, inside C4D. So when we brought in all this information, we could normalize it. And um, this is what I mean. So basically, if you look at this um, setup here carefully, you can see um, we have all these prearranged um, Mo not pre-arranged, but pre-recorded moments of data that we know what the person being recorded is experiencing. So you can see you have very conscious, um, very relaxed, relaxed but alert, high activity. And basically what that allowed us to do is kind of, it's almost like um, uh, a, the, you know, the, the code, the, um, the kind of key to a code. It kind of helped us understand what the numbers were coming in meant. And then you can see for each one of those we have five um, sort of uh, bar charts or graphs going left to right, and those are showing us the different waves. And then in the lights, we're just showing, or in those spheres, we're showing kind of the intensity of the different five different brain waves. And what this allowed us to do was come up with basically a formula that we could use to normalize all those numbers coming across. Sounds extremely scientific, but it wasn't because I was doing it and I built this and it actually wasn't that difficult. Um, what that then allowed us to do was go into our model inside C4D using those personality, uh, different sort of personality waves that we discussed earlier, that discussed earlier, you know, different waves, brain waves that have different personalities for different moments in the film, and use the data to drive their intensity. And this is what you get, uh, this kind of represents a person walking in off the street. Um, and this is our setup inside C4D using um, uh, X particles to build that geometry. Um, 
and then using some other controls to kind of control the, the lighting within them, but that control based on the data that was coming in, um, and then rendered with Arnold. And um, as you can see, this looks a little bit boring at the time. It's all kind of you know bland and gray and whatnot, but this was our base render coming out of C4D. And um, something I think is really important to understand, especially um, if you're doing this stuff in a smaller studio, is if render time is tight for you, you can really make use of multi-pass rendering so you get a lot of control after render. So um, I think in most cases, we only rendered these once, but we also rendered these separate color passes. Um, and these come out for free, basically. They don't take any extra render time. And um, these allowed us to do all kinds of post-production work with the color. So, um, you know, we didn't necessarily know what colors we wanted when we were rendering this the first time, but by having these, we could mix and match a lot of different colors in post and do a lot of our art direction basically inside After Effects where it's much faster to change things. <clears throat> and this is what it looks like when it's gone through that process in After Effects. And then we, um, we also rendered some other passes could give us some kind of um, flares out on the sides and stuff like that. And um, yeah, it looks really cool. It kind of, you know, does what it needs to do. Which it, it feels sort of scientific, but it also feels very much like the, the Lush brand. And it also does kind of convey the sense that you're inside someone's thoughts, inside someone's consciousness. Which um, you know, I think is quite a cool achievement, actually, because this was a this was a tricky one. I mentioned um, that you know we made a film for Lush, but one of the things that's really exciting about what we're doing these days is that things don't really stop with just a film. Um, you might be making lots of different versions or different outputs for social media, Twitter, whatever, um, Instagram, but you also end up um, sometimes making things that are completely different. In this case, for Lush, we actually made an installation. Um, this one is based on the breath design that um, that we did um, and this was uh, they put on an event um, our team of runners cut an incredibly l large amount of this um, rope over the course of a weekend and then they built this setup with um, our technologist Noel Drew and um, you could go and sit inside the system and it's driven by fans and lights and um, it would measure your breath and then it would make these things kind of move around you as you as you breathe which uh, is quite cool and um, I think that's really fun you know you, you take this stuff out kind of off the screen and, and put it in front of people and have people actually interact with it, especially as a designer. It's really fun to see actual people watching the material rather than just kind of sticking it on online or on broadcast and walking away. I understand that we have a bit of a Q&A coming up now, so I'm going to be here, um, here to answer any questions, uh, try to make sense of some of this stuff. Um, please feel free to, to ask anything you like. And thank you very much for watching the talk.